This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Number 16. Yet another one, before I call these written when there's no calculation involved, but yet another of them. What is the name given to a budget which has been prepared by building on a previous period's budgeted or actual figures? Well, again, it really is textbook. I mean, the answer is A, it's incremental budgeting. Incremental, you take last year's figures or last year's budget and then adjust them both for um, in expected inflation and for changes in the level of activity. If you think we're going to produce twice as many next year, fine, you'll take last year's figure for twice as much. Uh, the others, flexible budget, is when you take the existing budget, but then adjust it for the actual level of activity. We use that in variance analysis. A zero-based budget, that's the main alternative to incremental, where instead of basing it on uh, last year's figures, um, you effectively start again. You, you make decisions uh, from scratch. A functional budget. A functional is when you, you, you've got little budgets for individual departments, effectively individual parts of the business. So anyway, it's incremental. Uh, 17, back to some numbers. Based on the expected value criterion, which of the following represents the correct advice which tree should be given? So we know immediately uh, what the topic's covering, expected values, probabilities. Let's look at the information. Tree is considering employing a sales manager. Market research has shown that a good sales manager can increase profit by 30%, an average one by 20%, and a poor one by 10%. Experience has shown that we've attracted a good sales manager 35% of the time, average 45%, and a poor one 20%. Uh, the normal profits are 180,000 a year. Uh, and a sales manager's salary would be 40,000 per annum. Uh, it said again, uh, which of the following is the correct advice? Don't employ a sales manager because profits would fall. Employ a sales manager because profits would increase. Well, how are we going to do it? We know what the current profits are, 180,000. If we employ a manager, on the one hand, we'll have to pay out 40,000, but on the other hand, uh, we'll get higher sales. So what will the increase in sales be? If it's a good sales manager, the profit will go by 30%. And so the extra sales, 30% of the current profit of 180. Now, 30% is, I think, 54,000. Let me check. Yeah, 50. So this is the increase in our... Not, and I've put increase in sales. I'm sorry. It should be increase in profit. Anyway. On the other hand, if it's uh, an average manager, it'll increase the profits by 20%, which is 36,000. If it's a poor sales manager, uh, it'll increase by 10%, 18,000. It'll be one of, the, of those three. Uh, we know the probabilities. Um, the probability of getting a good manager is 35%, uh, an average one 45%, a poor one 20%, and the expected value, well I've already spoiled it I suppose, but the expected value, the weighted average, you multiply by the probabilities and add up. So 54,000 times 35% is 18,900. 
that is 6,000 times 45% is 16,200. 18,000 times 20% is 3,600. The total 38,700. So there's the expected value, the expected increase in profits, the average. Employ the manager, profits got by 38,700. However, it'll cost us to employ the manager. It says he gets a salary of 40,000. So on the one hand, profits up by 38,700, on the other hand, down by 40. As a result, there will be a decrease, a reduction in the profit of the difference of 1,300. So, which is how the answer is A. So, although that's back to numbers, again, I don't know whether you'd all agree with me, but I think the problem there shouldn't be the actual arithmetic. It's just speed on your calculator. The problem is, you know, it's when you're rushing in the middle of an exam. Take half an hour over that and it's easy. In the middle of an exam, when you're having to go at speed, with two sets of percentages floating around, it's so easy to misread uh, and end up making a mess of it. Uh, number 18. Using activity-based costing, what is the budgeted overhead cost per unit of product D? Well, of course, no problem here knowing what topic we're being tested on, activity-based. Uh, and what information are we given? Um, company manufactures two products, C and D. Uh, we're told for each of them the budgeted production, the labour hours per unit, uh, number of production runs, number of inspections. The overheads are listed below. There's production setup costs, inspection costs, and other overhead costs. Uh, and other overhead costs are absorbed on the basis of labour hours per unit. So a very standard little activity-based exercise. We're on the ass, so don't waste time. We're on the ass uh, to do product D. So don't waste time setting up C as well. And you'll know from uh, the lecture, there are two ways you can set up the arithmetic. They both give the same answer. Uh, the way I'm going to do, I think, is always personally the fastest, the safest, the easiest. I'm going to work out the total overheads for product D. And then when I've got the total, then it'll be easy. Uh, I'll get the overhead cost per unit. So let's go through them in turn. First of all, the, the overheads, the setup costs. That's 140,000. How many times are we setting up? Well, the number of production runs from the earlier table, 13C, 15D, in total 28. So the cost each time, 140,000 divided by 28. I won't bother dividing yet, but having got the cost each time, how much is going to be um, charged to D? D has 15 production runs. And so, let's do it 140,000 divided by 28. It's 5,000 each time with 15 production runs for D. In total, 75,000. Uh, next, inspection costs, exactly the same approach. Total overhead, 80,000. How many inspections are there? Uh, are, are, five and three, eight. So each inspection is costing 10,000. Product D, how many for D? It's three inspections. And so 10,000 each time, the total to D, 30,000. Finally, other overheads. And here's the very standard little trick. That trick's really the wrong word, but um, so many people do something very stupid here when they're hurrying. The total overhead 
find 96,000. We're doing it on labour hours, or what so many do, they say, ah, 8 for uh, C, 10 for D, that's 18, they divide by 18, well that's rubbish. Because the 8 and the 10 are hours per unit. Uh, and how many, uh, in total, how many hours do we need? Well, for C, it's a thousand units being produced at eight hours each. Uh, for D, it's four thousand being produced at ten hours per unit, a total of forty thousand. In total, forty-eight thousand hours. Now, I know the examiner gave it to us, but uh, in a minute, the, the time I spent isn't completely wasted. But we're spending 96,000 working 48,000 hours. So the overhead per hour is $2. How many hours are we working on D? Uh, on D, 4,000 units, 10 hours each. It's 40,000 hours. So at $2 an hour, it comes to a total of um, 80,000. So the total overheads for D, 7,500 and 585,000. Uh, finally though, that's the total overhead for D. We want the overhead cost per unit. Well, we're producing 4,000 units of D, which means the overhead cost per unit 185 divided by 4,000 is 46.25, which is B. Almost there. Let's go on to number 19. Which of the following types of control is the sales manager's action an example of? X uses rolling budgets, updating its forecast on a quarterly basis. After carrying out the last quarter's update, it projected a forecast cash deficit uh, loss of 400,000 at the end of the year. Uh, consequently, the planned purchase of new capital equipment has been postponed. Now, there's one thing I've never noticed before, actually. I'm not quite sure what the sales manager... Why the sales manager is involved? I think that's a sort of typing problem, but... Um, anyway, which of the following types of controls is an example of? The point is, we've done our budgets. It looks as though we're going to be short by 400,000. And so, to avoid it, we've decided to change our plans. We were intending to buy some new equipment, but we decided to delay it because we realised we're going to have this cash deficit. Well, that sort of um, thinking is known as feed-forward control. It's one use of budgets. I don't know why I'm writing that down. But one use of budgets is we do our budget, we see what's likely to happen, big profit, big loss, whatever. If we don't like it, here we don't want to have this big deficit, then we can change our plans right from the beginning. You know, postpone the uh, purchase of equipment, redo our budget, then perhaps now we're not going to have a cash deficit. That's feed forward. Uh, without going uh, through in detail the others, what feedback control is, is the other way we use budgets. You should all be aware with variance analysis, for example, usually every month we look back and we say, well, this month, did we do, did we spend more or less than we budgeted on spending? If it turns out last month I spent 10,000 too much on wages, well, we can't do it about last month, but we can try and correct it for future months. Well, that's feedback. When you're looking at what's already happened and using it for control, feed forward is what you've got here. When things haven't happened yet, you forecast something will happen. You change your plans to try and do better. All right, last of all for the multiple choice, 
uh, question 20. Which of the above circumstances favour a penetration pricing policy? Again, standard learning. If you've been through our notes and lectures, you'll know that these different pricing policies that you need to be aware of. Penetration pricing, um, uh, price skimming and so on. Here it's penetration pricing. Price, penetration pricing is where you charge a low price generally to try and gain market share. A lower price than the competition. The following circumstances may arise. <coughs> oh dear. The following circumstances may arise in relation to the launch of a new product. Which of the circumstances favour this idea of charging a low price? Uh, demand is relatively inelastic. No. If it's inelastic, it means the demand isn't going to change much with changes in the price. Well, that's not what we want. The purpose here of having a low price is to try and sell a lot more. If it's inelastic, drop the price, it won't make much difference to how many you sell. So it's not one. Two, there are significant economies of scale. Yes. You see, if we charge a low price, and as a result we sell a lot more, well, if you're selling a lot more and there are economies of scale, that'll mean the cost per unit uh, reduces. And if the cost per unit is lower, well, we can afford to charge a lower price. Three, we want to discourage new entrants. Yes, charge a low price. It's harder for other people uh, to start producing the same product and to be able to match our price. If you're charging a high price, other people want to do it to make them, because they think they'll make nice profits. And finally, four, uh, 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 the product life cycle is particularly short. And no, if it's a very short life cycle, you want to get as much profit as you can as quick as you can before it finishes. Um, so no, it's not that one. So it's two and three. The correct answer is A.